Okay, greetings, compadres. Greetings for your chaplain's chat today. Um, I have such a great guest that I am excited to get to know. And I almost forgot the mystery meat sandwich because I was so excited about jumping in talking to her. So I'll rewind for a second. Um, because I started chatting with her and all of a sudden I kind of lost my train of thought and thought, oh, we're not even started yet kind of thing. So for your mystery meat sandwich today, a small beginning of a paragraph in the book, Wholehearted Faith by Rachel Held Evans. And here's what it says. For better or for worse, there are seasons when we hold our faith and then there are seasons when our faith holds us. In those latter instances, I am more thankful than ever for all the saints past and present who said yes and whose faith sustains mine. For they believe for me when I'm not sure I believe. They hold on to hope for me when I've run out of hope. I just thought that was beautiful because then she kind of goes on to talk about how you know, maybe it's somebody in the grocery store who, you know, just sparks our interest when we get that kind of third eye or put on that new pair of glasses and we can see somebody else and they remind us of God's love. And I just thought that was beautiful. I loved it. I loved it. And for me, a lot of times, <laughs> the part where I struggle is hypothetically speaking, I guess, uh, the TSA. I have a tough time with the TSA. I've talked a lot about that. And also <laughs> with mansplaining sort of misogynistic men. Um, and so those are kind of my two personal real challenges. So whoever it is for you today, maybe, maybe, just maybe we can be that bridge and we can, you know, see those people as carriers of a message for us, maybe. So I just wanted to start with that. And now I'm ready to move into the chaplain's chat. And so um, before I read her bio, I've got to point out that Hillary Boyce and I have some things in common. First of all, we know like 10,000 of the same people. And <laughs> 100%. We, right. We're both recovering evangelicals and we both attended the same university. What, what, what? So here it is. Hillary is a foodie, an occasional retreat chef, server, coffee connoisseur, quitlit book junkie. She's an Enneagram too, and a divorced mom to two amazing kids. She's passionate about gathering around a table and connecting people through food and stories. She completely understands the joy and pain of the hospitality industry with an alcohol-centric culture that can fuel an alcoholic-driven life. Hillary has been sober for more than six years and is active in three sobriety groups, including 12-Step, Sober Mom Squad, and Ben's Friends. Now, here's the thing. Originally, um, I was introduced to Hillary by Enneagram coach Freya Kennedy, and it was like, you know, ding, ding, ding. I was talking about my love for 12 step sobriety with Freya. And, you know, I believe there are many different paths to sobriety. So enter Freya telling me about Hillary and Hillary's connection to a recovery group called Ben's Friends, which I just mentioned. So Ben's Friends mm -hmm. offers support to those in the restaurant industry. Founded in 2016, the mission of Ben's Friends is to offer hope fellowship, and a path forward to anyone who struggles with substance abuse or addiction. By coming together, starting a dialogue, and acknowledging that substance abuse cannot be overcome by isolation and willpower alone. Yes, Ben's Friends hopes to write a new chapter in the lives of food and beverage professionals across the country. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. so Hillary, I'm thrilled to have you here. And I just wondered... I mean, besides being, you know, uh, somebody who has excellent taste in picking a university and um, <laughs> and, in, and in people that we both know, um, <laughs> I was wondering if you would just give us just, you know, however much you're comfortable with about your background. 
Absolutely. Well, Amy, thank you so much. And this is great. I love that a podcast finally got us a coffee date together (laughs) because I've been wanting to, um, I mean, we've been circulating in the same circles, like from a distance forever. So this is fabulous. And thank you for having me and I'm super excited to be here. Uh, Yeah. So I'll just jump in, not waste time. Um, I, yeah, like you said, we went to the same university. So my upbringing, um, I was raised in a pretty, um, well, it's, it was kind of crazy because on one hand, they sent us to a very um, small, strict school. So uh, my graduating class of high school was 17 people. It was a K through 12 Christian school. Um, and I, I'm i the second child of six children. Um, so I, I have two awesome sisters, three amazing brothers. Um, so we had this you know, I had, I, to be honest, a very privileged upbringing. Um, my dad was a doctor and, uh, you know, we lived on the house on the hill and we were at the country club and we had ski lessons and all those things, you know, I mean, that's just, you know, how I was raised and I had a private education that was important to my parents. Um, and yet there was this, um, current that, um, in the household that, I didn't quite understand when I was little, um, everything. Um, but in seventh grade, my mom sat us down and said, Hey, you know, your dad has a drinking problem and we're going to get counseling and we're going to make this right. And we're going to work it all out. And so we all just kind of, you know, sat down and, um, this was something, something that was going to happen. And so she, so I was raised going to church. I was sent to church with the neighbors. I was the only kid that didn't get homesick. So I went to like multiple summer camps because you can understand, you can understand this. My mom had six children. Oh, she's the kid that is like self-sufficient, can go off, you know, entertain herself, do her thing. And um, and I loved it. I loved every bit of it. I loved church camp. I loved it all. I mean, and I even, to be honest, loved my Christian school. I mean, I fit in. Um, it was small. It was fun. I loved music. I loved singing. That's hence what brought me to the college we share. Um, and so, you know, hook, line and sinker, I was all into summer camp. I was like your rah, rah girl. I also had an older sister who was very colorful and I love her to pieces and she will totally stand by this. Um, and is free to share. Like she was like the little rebel begging to go to public school, throwing the parties, like, you know, staining the carpet with grand, Ma- grand Marnier, like everyone throwing up on grand Marnier. And, and so I just, as the second child watched and did, you know, you either like tend to do the opposite. And so I was straight A, cheerleader, like ridiculous, nauseating, like, you know, homecoming queen, all the thing, right? Like, so I was a little miss, I was going to be perfect. Um, hence, you know, not uncommon to people that struggle with alcohol. I think the first problem was food, right? And so like, you know, and, and the message was, if you're thin enough, you'll be happy, Um, So that started pretty young. Um, And I also think it was a means of control because it was coincidentally kind of got out of control when everything was kind of falling off with my family at home in high school. And um, a whole other podcast and story is that um, my dad was a practicing doctor that lost his license because of his addiction and ended up being in an adult family home from the time he was in his late forties, early fifties till he passed away in his eighties. Whole other story. Um, I also, a whole other story is I found out when I was in junior high that this dad that raised me was not actually my dad. And, um, but he had adopted me and my sister. Um, and this is my mom's story to tell. So I won't spend a lot of time there, but it's just a fact in my life that at about, you know, 12, 13, I discovered accidentally that he was not my biological father, but we were all raised. Um, and the rest of the kids didn't know that either until later, except my older sister, obviously, because she was old enough and remembered everything. And so it's just part of, part of my journey, part of my story. Um, I don't blame any of that, like creating a problem of alcohol for me, because I think we can get into this victim mentality of like, oh, I didn't know my dad. I had daddy issues. Oh, I like, I did the whole disordered eating thing for a phase, you know, Um, I don't know if it's my generation or what, I mean, it really, I have come to understand now, you know, it's, it's how I dealt with pain, you know? Um, and since then I've done, you know, the work around that also, but so fast forward, I think, um, so I was going to do it right. I was going to go to college, get married, you know, save myself for marriage. Right. You know, all the things, um, I was going to follow the playbook and then God was supposed to like give me the life I wanted. Right. Like this whole, like, that's how my relationship was, you know? I mean, I also think there was like sincerity in there of like, just 
I believe that there's this creator spirit of the universe, like, you know, and I've come to understand, I don't, I've really opened my mind up to like, um, you know, I love that we get to pick our own conception of God. Mm -hmm. And, and I know that there is a higher power and, um, just someone who has watched out for me from the time I was little and faith came to me easy when I was little. And so I love the quote that you started with. I literally got chills. Um, Rachel held Evans. I remember when she passed, um, I mean, just a wonderful person. Um, and, you know, but I did have this Western perfect Christianity idea of, you know, and totally like a contractual, like if I do, then you do. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And so it was like, um, so I went off to Christian college and honestly, at that point, um, that's when all the wheels were falling off and my life was it like my family of origin became very different, um, in the sense of like, I mean, they lost everything essentially. So grew up very privileged. And then by the time I got to college, um, through a series of events, you know, um, it was a completely different situation. And so I went off to college and I, and my other brothers and sisters were young and I just felt horrible guilt, like leaving them behind. Um, but I also, there was also something in me that knew I had to go. And so I went off and I, um, you know, I was going to get my degree. I was, I was right on the cusp before everything like technology. I mean, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have all this. I mean, I think my senior year, we finally got an email and started having to do our assignments. And I think you were two years behind me. So you probably had, you were a little more far advanced on the technology, right? <laughs> um, <people>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like youth group queen, like through high school, through college, church, like I said, church camp, all the things. And so when I got to college, you know, it was a Christian liberal arts college, um, I just super plugged in. I plugged into choir, have my choir hair today, you know, the bigger hair, the closer to God. Yeah, oh my God. Right. I don't think I could sing actually very good. I think because I had good hair, I was put in the center. Um, <laughs> that is the honest truth. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I always felt a little lost and I always felt like suffering a little bit from, um, what is that? Uh, imposter syndrome. I didn't know what it was, but I think, you know, and I had a terrible time picking my major because I just thought, no, everyone's further along than me. I just believe that like idea, you know, um, they either have the music thing figured out or they have the, I thought maybe I'd want to be a teacher. And I was like, no, no, I couldn't possibly be that disciplined. Um, although all my best friends from school are teachers. Uh, and I ended up marrying a teacher. Um, so anyway, so I'm at college, I come home from college and I help out with youth group and I meet the boy and he's super plugged into youth group. Um, and we do this long distance relationship. So we never dated like in real life, like as far as like living in the same city or doing that thing, but he had faith, I had faith. So it's like, perfect. We're going to change our family trees. Our story is going to be totally different. We're not going to make the same mistakes our parents made. It's going to be amazing. And uh, coincidentally, um, I didn't know how important it would be at the time, but his mother was a raging alcoholic. I mean, that's just fact. That's not like misspeak. And I loved her and we got along really well. And here's the story. Okay, let me, um, I didn't start drinking. I was a goody two shoes. So I didn't drink in high school. I didn't drink in college. I didn't, I had a sip of champagne on our wedding night. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually like, we are not having an open bar. I don't want anyone like getting wasted and like throwing up on my wedding dress. Like, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's how naive and ridiculous I was. Um, when I got married, I was 22. He was 23. Um, we were really good friends actually. And we had a lot of fun and I'm tempted to believe now because we were married 20 years and I'm divorced six years, coincidentally along my sobriety date. Um, not a shocker. Uh, so, you know, it's tempted to change the story and be like, we were too young. We probably shouldn't have gotten together all these things. We never, you know, like it's easy to rewrite it, but I actually recently was putting together my son's 18th birthday pictures. And I found all our like anniversary cards, letters, letters we wrote during college. Cause we actually like snail mail wrote letters. Um, like it was crazy. We burned up the lines to, it was GTE back then. It was a landline. There was no cell phones. It was hundreds of dollars. It was ridiculous. We were broke college kids that would spend tons of money on, you know, the actual yeah. phone. Um, so anyway, before my senior year, he did actually a, a really romantic proposal of air land and sea. Oh, you'll appreciate that it involved the plane. So, um, he got my best friend, Chris, he got her in on it, surprised me and sent me off, um, on a plane back to Seattle. Cause my school was in Southern California, um, where he had someone waiting to pick me up. So that was land. And then see, he had his brother-in-law out at the Muckleteo, um, uh, waterfront, grabbed me and he was waiting for me like on this 
uh, private island. I know, right? Oh. It was crazy. It was super ridiculous. Before anything was like posted and you were doing it for like effect. Like nobody knew about this or saw this. It was just for me. So <laughs> anyway, it. he's a really good dude, actually. Um, so back to, I didn't drink the first five years of my marriage because we were broke. He was a student teacher. I graduated from our college, got married right after whisked up to Northern Cal or Northern Washington, Bellingham. So I was completely isolated off the bat. I thought I would be coming back and hang out with my friends and family. And it was like, nope, it's you and him. And you've never lived together or been together whatsoever. Um, I was super all kinds of lonely. And that's when for me, like, um, just that I call it the soul hole. Um, and what yeah. I know to be now is part of the alcoholism. It's part of the need for male validation. It's like, just all the things in us where like, we don't understand our wounds, like that we have just because we're living as human beings, right? Like, it's not like, you know, I mean, yes, I had some rough aspects to my growing up, but, you know, I'm definitely not a victim and we all have wild stories when it mm -hmm. comes to it. But so just that I had this hunger that really raged, like, after I got married, because there was nothing I was chasing after anymore. It was like, I got the degree. I got the boy. Like, why am I not filled? What is wrong? Why am I needing male attention? Like, and I'm still searching for my purpose. And, um, my former spouse, he, he was a teacher, as I said, and a coach. And he's just so full. He's an eight on the Enneagram. So mm -hmm. full of just like drive and passion and had vision. And I just felt like I was out here floundering, like not knowing what to do. And, um, so we, we lived in Bellingham for the first two years and I tried to find work up there with a sociology degree, you know, at best I was a hostess at Red Robin. So that's where my restaurant industry started at 22 with a college degree. Talk about humbling and ridiculous. Um, and then two years into up there, we just, we last minute, he got a job down to, in, um, the Edmond school district and we were off and it was exciting because it was something different and we were finally gonna be closer to family and that was going to be good. We did a geographic, so that was going to get better. Right. And, and he just started building his career and doing, and he was, you know, I think I can share this respectfully, you know, he wasn't going to be the shit show that his parents were. And so he was constantly like working so hard to be the best teacher, the best coach. And it was awesome. And he was, and I mean, he got P teacher of the year, all the things. And, um, and I just, I, I got to make ends meet. I got into the restaurant industry and, um, first it was at the pancake house in North Seattle where all his family worked in. It was a blast. And then, um, it had to unexpectedly close. And so I remember I applied for a restaurant in Edmonds and I was working lunch shift and then we needed more money and he was getting his master's. And so then I helped open a Tully's. So I'd go to Tully's in the morning and I would go to Chantrell at lunch and then, so I'd be a barista and I would do the lunch shift. And I just was feeling like, oh, we got it. Like if we're ever going to get ahead, you know, we just got it. We can't have more debt with education. And, and so that was the aim. And in the middle of that, I had these great regulars and they invited me over to the, to work at their restaurant down the street. And I, I went into night service. And the reason why that's important going from like lunch to evening is because that is where I discovered the after shift drink, which is really in restaurant um, super, uh, everyone knows if you're in a restaurant, everyone's living for the shifty or the jammer or whatever. And, um, and it wasn't out of control there necessarily, but that was for me. Um, also when I was at the coffee shop in Tully's, I had a girlfriend invite me out to a show at the Paramount or something. And she ordered a glass of wine with dinner. And I'd never done that before. And it was like, Oh, that's a thing. And so I had a glass of wine at dinner and with her and, and there was one other time I remember, and it was just this warm feeling of like, oh, it just felt like in the midst of like searching for meaning and working so hard, it was like just in a loneliness that wasn't anyone's fault. I didn't know how to communicate my needs. He didn't, he was doing his best because in his mind, it's like, I got to provide and we got to, you know, have a future for these family and like a house and all the things. And um, I just got more into the restaurant. And more into as he was coaching and teaching and, um, and just more into like, oh, and then there was tequila slammers and then there was, you know, and it just became a thing like, mm. and after discovering it, it just had this hold where I had finally found something to quiet that voice, that inner, like, uh, just longing. Right. And simultaneously, I will say, you know, 
I looked, um, I had regulars in the restaurant. I think the restaurant industry kind of can lend yourself to being vulnerable to getting emotionally attached to people, especially if you're feeling extra lonely. And so just kind of, for me, it all went hand in hand. Um, the need for male validation, the emotional attachments, and then, um, and, and the drinking and then, and then knowing in my head, well, that doesn't align with my values. And so I needing more drink to quiet my conscience. And so then, um, okay. So I know I need to hustle forever and I get through all this. So, um, I got pregnant with my daughter and I didn't, you know, thankfully for me, it wasn't, my drinking wasn't to the point in 2003 where it was hard to give up drinking for pregnancy yet. Cause it was pretty still inconsistent, but the problem was I could either handle it or not handle it. I mean, mm -hmm episodes started happening, finding my cell phone smashed in my car door after doing tequila shots after work, you know, um, and then it just started adding up. Right. And, and this was all new to my husband at the time we were married five years and I didn't drink the first five years of marriage. And all of a sudden, like these episodes were happening. Right. And it was like, obviously if I was showing any sense of that, what we were dating from his past of an alcoholic mom, like the marriage wouldn't have happened. Right. Like, he, you know, he already knew that storyline and that wasn't going to be his. Right. And I already knew that storyline because it happened in my family too. So I knew better. I wasn't going to have an alcoholic family either or home. And so I had my daughter, I went back. Um, actually, you know, then I got pregnant. I did go back a little bit to work in the restaurant, just part-time. So he could have time with her at nights and we could have a little bit of money. And then I got pregnant right away with my son, like at about nine months. And it was pretty funny because I was headed to New York to celebrate my 30th with my sister, my little sister, who's awesome. And, um, as well as my other sister, Anna, and I, I, something in me, even though Maggie was only like nine months old, I was like, I feel like I need to take a pregnancy test. And I remember it was Valentine's of um, 2004 and it was right before we headed to New York. And I, I was like, oh, yep, I'm pregnant. And so I put it in a little Nordstrom box and then I, I went over to my former spouse at the time and I was like, Ah, oh, hey, here, I got you something. And it was in a little Nordstrom like watch box. And he's like, I thought we were doing presents, you know? And I was like, you want to take a look at this. And so um, he opened it and he's like, what is this real? And I was like, cause he, it wasn't, we didn't really ever, ever talk about it, but I always knew cause we waited seven years to have kids after we we're married. I was like, once it's on, it's on. And so I was like, yep, it's real. So, um, so I went to New York and then it was hilarious. I was at nightclubs and someone's like, please don't let it catch on fire. Or let me like, I can't let my daughter, like, I can't die in a nightclub in New York. I just, I don't know why I had this irrational fear that I was going to die in a nightclub. <laughs> So, yeah. um, but it was, um, it was still an amazing trip and I didn't drink and then had my son. Um, I took time off from the restaurant industry because I had babies and, um, and I stayed home with them and that was a long period of time. But then I discovered here comes in the piece of, um, the, you know, the whole wine mom situation culture mm -hmm. that wasn't, I feel like I, I mean, I'm not going to take credit for starting it, but I feel like it was more of a thing in my world before it was really a thing. And maybe it's just because we didn't yeah. have the social media that we have now. But, right. and I think in your story too, like, um, you know, I started cracking it open to make dinner mm -hmm. and I, you know, and drinking the glass of wine with dinner and I'm a foodie and I love food and I was exploring more of cooking and like, and then all of a sudden that one bottle of wine turned into two and then all that, you know, and, um, and so I'll fast forward um, to 211, 212. Um, I got more dependent on drinking and cooking and momming. So I was living the mommy wine culture hardcore um, in by 211. So much so that my husband and some close girlfriends came to me and said, you have a problem and we're concerned about you. It was totally in love. And, you know, some college friends, actually, we had taken a trip probably a couple of years earlier and some of my best college friends, um, we were up at uh, Trinity in their cabins and, um, and I was a disaster. Like, you know, I was the only one passing out at night. I was the only one that was like slurring my words. I, you know, they were all having a glass of wine or having a margarita, but, you know, they weren't horrifying. Like my children weren't totally like traumatized yet. Um, at that point it, they were probably like five and six. And, um, but my, I remember those friends, my college friends started to like pay attention. And my one friend just was like, when you're ready to talk about it, let's talk. And like, I'm not going to participate with you. And I just kind of mm -hmm. shut her out promptly. 
And then, um, and so then back fast forward to 211, 212, some of my like long time, really good friends, um, close girlfriends. I kept trying to like keep up appearances and act good. And I'd get invited to these like church lady friend, you know, things, women hang out mm -hmm. and I'd have Chardonnay in my Starbucks car, you know, in my Starbucks cup and thinking no one knew, but then by the end of the night, I'm like dumping it on my like coat and I reek of like a freaking Chardonnay thing. I mean, it's just like coming out of my pores, you know? And so they asked me, so at the end of 211, my spouse and a couple girlfriends just said, Hey, like, we need you to take a look at this and we need you to get help and we'll support you. We'll do whatever you can. I know it's terrifying. And I was terrified and I did not want to go, but I also didn't want to lose my children. And that was kind of at that point, my spouse is using those words, like, you need to do something or I'm going to take the kids. And I was like, well, no, you're not. So I was like, I can like a good student and a perfect like rule follower and goody two shoe. I can do this thing. So I went to actually residence 12 in Kirkland, mm -hmm. um, fall of 2011. And I crossed my T's out of my eyes and I didn't drink during that time. Um, went through all of it. I was, you know, AA was a part of the mandate of like going to treatment. Um, but I was voluntarily going at that point, right? Like nothing, I wasn't court ordered or anything like that. So I went and, um, except for the one, um, one mom's cookie party. Cause I didn't told any of like my school mom friends that I wasn't drinking or that I was in treatment. Cause I really wasn't ready yet. I couldn't get honest yet. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I just thought it was, I was thought, cause he had an alcoholic mom. I thought my friends were too churchy and they were like just overbearing. And so I was in complete denial doing the whole thing. And I know it, it was required and I went and I would hear seeds of truth and I would cry a little bit. And then and in that whole time that I was going to AA, I never heard get a sponsor, which is amazing because I'm sure they were saying it. I just never heard it. So I didn't get a sponsor in 211, 212. And I didn't really have any intention of like sticking with it, to be honest. So I went to the continue. I, I graduated perfectly. I will say to speak the hundred percent truth. There was one mom's cookie thing where I championed and controlled it. And my husband actually had flown out to DC to get a, like a, an honor. <laughs> and I just had like that one night. I kept it in control and I was like, I'm going to give myself this one night and, um, but I'm going to have to go back to treatment and hope I don't get like tested. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't like, I like lucked out. And so, so I say I did the four or five months or whatever treatment I was doing at res 12, like perfectly, except for one day is the honest truth. And then, and then as soon as it went into continuing care and you know what, and I kind of kept them out of like the family groups. Like I didn't like really encourage him to come, but then I could create this storyline. Well, he's not like invested in my recovery and like, you know, and I could keep that line of like, he's too busy, like being the best coach and teacher. And like, I would just blame him. Right. A lot of gross stuff, you know, and yeah. instead of taking responsibility, I just wasn't ready. And so, um, you know, so I didn't want anyone to get too like invested in me getting sober. And so I quit continuing care and I, um, and then I had this conversation with my husband at the time. I said, listen, I'm, I got the, I, I know what we're going to do now. We're going to have a calendar and we're going to agree to the social events in advance. So there's no going to be no spontaneous drinking. And I know this is going to sound familiar to you manage your drinking much. Like let's try and go manage it. Let's tip our hats off to you. See how well that works. Well, it works as well as you think it's going to work for someone that just cannot drink. Um, I said it would only be like maybe two nights a week, max, only pre-planned social events, so just all these controls, right? Mm -hmm. Complete disaster or failure. Like, and he looked at me and he wanted so badly to believe me. But I, if I really looked into his eyes, I knew he was just like, what the f are we doing? <laughs> like, this is like, this is going to be a disaster. You've proven enough over the years what this is going to turn into. But he wanted, he went along with it, bless his heart, for a minute mm -hmm. until I just you know, it just, just took off. I mean, and it took off from 212 to 216, like in the worst way, like, you know, I don't know what happened, but now I'm getting IV bags at the clinic, you know, it must've, someone must've slipped something in my drink at that social event. You know, I mean, it couldn't possibly be that I'm drinking too much. Right. Like, and so all the things I crashed a car into a telephone pole on third Avenue and they didn't somehow it was, they didn't ask me if I'd been drinking. It was a Sunday night. And I said, I came from a work from work. I didn't say work party. And so they didn't. And for whatever reason, maybe I got shocked into a little bit of sobriety or they didn't smell it. I don't know. I mean, I think it was God saying like, I'm giving you a chance here. Like, are you going to take this lifeline? Like, 
Um, so yeah, so crash on the telephone pole, scared me straight for two weeks. The kids were really worried. Um, they were in, you know, elementary school. I made promises that I couldn't keep. I, um, it did scare me, but then within two weeks it was like something in my brain was like, I'm going to be okay. I'll manage it. Don't worry. And, um, and so off it went and, um, and then about two fourteen, my husband at the time said, listen, you're married to the bottle. Um, oh, side note. I went back to part-time work at a different restaurant, um, because he laid the boundary that no longer were our family finance is going to go to alcohol. Mm. And so, um, and I had done, I had stayed at home with kids. I had nannied, I had done a whole bunch of side jobs, like just to be at home with my kids. Cause that was my dream to be a mom. Like, that's all I wanted was, I mean, I know I'm a throwback. I know it's not cool, but like literally for me, my purpose in life, not to not in a, like not unhealthy way, but like, I have a piece and a purpose, like momming hard. Like I would have had eight if I could have, <laughs> but, um, and honestly, my drinking, I mean, when I'd bring up more kids, he's like, well, show me that, like, you're going to get this drinky thing into control and maybe I'll consider it, you know? And, um, I never was able to, um, so it's on me and, um, you know, cause I came from six, so I'm comfortable with the big, crazy family that feels right at home with me. I'm super grateful for my two, my two amazing kids. And, and so, I mean, but they were enough to get me sober the first time in treatment. Um, and you know, if I understand anything, I understand mom guilt, mm, like, yeah, you know, because here's where my drinking, I'll get to the like rock bottom. I was back in restaurant. I was working all the time. I was going out to the bars afterwards. It was because I had so much, like, I just couldn't face where it had gotten. I mean, I was under the lash of alcohol. I no longer had a choice. Like I, you know, I thought I was in control. I thought, you know, I can give it up anytime but it was, I was lying to myself in. And so, so it was running my life. Um, and in around two fourteen, he said, Hey, I don't want to divorce you. I don't want to put our kids through that. We've both been through that with our families. Like, I don't want to put them through the pain of that, but you know, you're married to the bottle. So can we just have like a respectable business relationship, at least till our son's 18. And at the time, like I had such a bravado and like, just like, kind of F you attitude, but inside I was like, and he didn't see this because that's not what I was showing. I was just like, well, fine. You don't love me. Cool. I'm going to drink some more. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're right. I'm going to, my boyfriend, you know, um, uh, Jack Daniels we're on. So, and then that just translated into picking up more restaurant shifts. And I was at the restaurant all the time. And then I was at, you know, in our neighborhood, everyone knew me at the, and it seemed better because they were fancy bars, you know, they weren't like dive bars. Um, and I wasn't coming home and, and, and it doesn't make sense when like the biggest thing you want to do is be a mom and you're out like every night, like you can't explain it. It's like, people are like, if you know, your husband's going to eventually leave you because of alcohol, why don't you quit drinking? It's like, if you know, it's stealing time with your kids, why don't you quit drinking? And I was as honest, I was telling the honest truth when I said, I don't, I don't know. Like, I mean, like when, you know, it's, I didn't, I genuinely didn't understand my problem at the time. So they were accustomed to me not coming home every night and working because I would work at a hair salon on Saturday mornings and I would work in the bar or I'd work at a restaurant, not a bar, but then I would go to the bar and I just was never, I had so much guilt and shame. I was never home. So we're in January, 2016 towards the end of it. Um, it had gotten so, so bad that like my husband's time made sure I never picked up the kids from school because he didn't trust that I wasn't drinking. I'd gotten a keychain breathalyzer um, to prove, you know, like if I needed to do something with the kids, he's like, okay, you got to blow into it and stuff. And so this particular night, um, but I knew how to trick it. Mm -hmm. True story. Um, and I wasn't supposed to have to drive my daughter to meet him at his game. He was coaching, but he, um, but then last minute she wanted to go. And so I had to take a video of me blowing a zero, which I did. And so he still didn't want me to do it, I'm sure, but it looked like I was fine. And, um, and I knew better. I'd known I had had drinks, like, cause my routine was to work the lunch shift, have drinks, you know, and the fall before the January, I had some, I went to work, I went and worked a lunch shift. I took a break and I was going back to work night shift and I totally had drinks in between, went back, worked in a blackout and, but 
they waited a week to kind of talk to me about it. And so that was another wake up call besides crashing the car, besides right before it was about to happen, happen. And they didn't fire me. They just wanted me to get help. And so I made another promise. Oh, I'll never like, that'll never happen again. And so, um, so all these signs. And so that night I drove her to the game and then I went down to her brewery and I was kind of that day or within that week, I'm not quite sure. I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror anymore. And I remember trying to face myself and I just hit this, like, as we know, is it the incomprehensible demoralization? Like I'd like, I just, I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror and I kind of was like, okay, I guess this is who I am now. And I guess maybe if I make it, this is such a, like, so sad. And like, like, I, I guess this is what I do and who I am. And this is how I drink. And I may not make it to my daughter's wedding. And at that point I was so sick that that like in my mind was like, I guess that's, that's it. Like, this is how I'm going down. Like Mm -hmm. I really, my world had become so small. Um, I had huge, huge guilt and shame. Huge mom guilt and shame, huge guilt and shame from the lifestyle I was living, doing the restaurant thing and just trying to basically earning money so that I could keep drinking and not impact impact my family's finances. And so that particular night, I kind of broke all my rules because I I had risked drinking and driving a lot and I had never been caught. I should have been a billion times. Um, But that particular night, I was further away than I typically was. I had two IPAs, but right before I went into the brewery, I like had stopped at a gas station and downed this disgusting drink. And then, and then when I left, it was like right before midnight, which wasn't typically every night I would block out. And so like, I knew better than to be further away at that particular time. And so I, um, but then in my mind, I made this conscious, I remember making this conscious decision. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to go the freeway. I'm going to go back roads because I'm going to travel like slower and that'll be safer. Mm -hmm. And like, so somehow in my mind, and then it's also my favorite bar is probably just closing down in Edmond. So that'll all like, I'll just take one more drink. We're good. Well, so I take these back way home, like roads home. And then, um, in the process of that, like, I don't know that I'm driving horribly. And so I get called in. I don't know that. Um, so I go to make the stop at the last bar and, um, and I'm rounding the roundabout and, um, I see the lights behind me and I'm thinking, oh, I'm just going to like in my delusional drunken state, I'm going to show him my stuff and be on my way into the bar for the last drink. And I'm sure when I unrolled my window, he got like punched in the face with like just all the ethanol like coming off of me. And so I'm like, he's like, Hey ma'am, how's it going? I just want to make sure you can operate this car safely. And I was like, Oh, here you go. Like, and I'm like acting like this is an actual traffic stop. And then failed the field sobriety test. He took me in. I wouldn't blow because somewhere in my mind, I heard that was like a good thing. And then I know. Right. And so at first, but then, um, he took me to one station before I went into the County station. And, and I had said, I only had two, which was the truth at the last stop. But like, you know, at that point I was drinking around the clock and had like, I knew like the whole, like how things would work. So anyway, I finally got in and I was freezing when they like, like brought me in and I had to wait for a really long time. I just remember that was like terrible. And, um, and, and then when they finally got up to process me, and then actually I did end up blowing, which ended up being a good thing for me, um, as far as legally and all that. Um, and it was like a 2.8 or something like that. So he looked at me, he's like two. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, but then when I went up to get processed, the officer processing me was like, Oh, a little too many at mom's night out. And I was like, And I was starting to sober up and I was like, are you joking me? I'm like too soon. This is like, I just destroyed my life because I knew if I got a DUI, that was it. Like in my mind, that was the end of my world. Like, and so anyway, um, we, a lot of similar things on that first night, I got some pro tips from people and then the gal was, had mercy on me. And actually I didn't share a cell, um, she gave me my own, whoever like was in charge of that. She's like, do you want your own cell? She gave me that choice. And I was like, yes. And, um, and the whole thing, like someone telling me this is who you need to, you know, you need, here's the time when they're gonna let you out of your cell and when you can call and all the things. And I know I now I need to like 10 times go fast. I just realized where time is at. But, um, so I just knew like I was screwed. Like everything was over. I'm laying in that hard, cold floor. I refuse to eat or drink or come out of my cell or do anything while I'm there. And I, like, I don't call my spouse. 
I just find a way to get the bail. But in here's the turning point. When I'm laying there, I did pray and I said, okay. And that was like the, the breaking, the whatever it takes, the like breakthrough of like, if you're going to have a chance, I knew everything was over and going to be different going forward. And as terrified, I'd come to that place as terrified as I was of giving up alcohol. I, um, I knew like I had to, but I was terrified. And so I just said, whatever it takes. And I could never say whatever it take took like, and so something shifted, something changed in that cry for help. And it was that simple of a prayer, whatever it takes. There was nothing like super spiritual. And so, um, I remember getting released and getting my clothes back from, you know, my party girl clothes, my cell phone was dead. Um, and I walked out of the, like, they just like open this side door and you're on the street. And I remember kind of defiantly, kind of like a punk ass to God, like, all right, well, you know how life's been going for me and how much I rely on this alcohol. Like, I dare you. Like, um, if you think like you can help me like not drink, good luck, you know, it's kind of like, I'll do it, but I don't think, you know, even you God can like keep me sober. And so it was like, it was a definite choice of if I went right, it was going to be down bar row in Everett. Cause I was in the Sonoma County jail. It was either going to be like, everyone calls it like the Hewitt run or like down there. And there's so many bars or I was going to go left. And for whatever reason, power greater than me, I went left. I found a cab there was no, I wasn't Uber savvy in 216. Um, it was an old guy who had a flip phone. Let me call to get my car to see if I could meet the, to get my car out of impoundment. And it had been like over 24 hours. And here's the sad news. No one missed me in my house. Like no one was like calling the police or anything because I lived such a lifestyle that that wasn't rare. And so, and they didn't even know what happened. And so, um, so that's the thing. And I, I went, I called my friends that I knew were sober. Um, AA was suggested to me. And so here was my second foray into AA. And I just, I had to start going. And um, I mean, I had you to save my life. And I actually had desire to get honest. And um, I will say at 90 days sober, I went like to this women's retreat. um, And I still like, I mean, I was like, still like, I felt like sobering up. Like, I didn't know what they were saying. It was a 12 step thing. They went over all the 12 steps in a weekend. I didn't know what to do, but at that point, um, oh, and then right after the DUI, when I found, he's like, why is there money missing out of our account? And I had to get it out for impounding. Um, I was like, well, and like, so I fessed up and, um, and he said, okay, cool. You need to get your own insurance. You know, da, da, da. And so when I called the car insurance and I said, Hey, I'm, and then I met with, okay, here's another, like, it's a key point because when I went to meet with a lawyer, the whole, like getting honest, instead of trying to find a way to spend a lot of money to get off. It was like, I finally admitted. And I said, I'll go deferred because I, I think if I don't like admit, I have a problem and go that route, I'll be back here again with my second DUI. No, no, you know, for sure. And so I went that route. And, um, and so when I call back to calling the car place, <laughs> they were, I was like, I'm not going to have to have high risk because I'm doing deferred. And they were like, um, they're like, okay, but in light of the divorce, we didn't drop you anyway. We're just going to separate it out. So I found out I was getting divorced when I had to like change my car insurance. <laughs> and oh. so I shot a text to my <laughs> spouse at the time. And I was like, hey, so call the insurance. And and the sad state was we just were like for the past year, like hadn't been talking to each other. And so anyway, so the GUI was January 2016. The divorce was the fastest divorce on the planet. I had so much guilt and shame. I didn't fight anything. I just was like, yeah, like fair enough you know, for what I've put you through the last forever. And, um, we, you know, the fastest divorce you can get in the state of Washington is 90 days. And that's exactly what happened. And it was two months shy of 20 years. And, um, I stayed in the restaurant because I just, they knew I was honest about my GUI. It was friends of mine that I worked for in the restaurant at that time. They were, they were the same ones worried about me when I came back to work in a blackout. Um, And because I was outed, I knew I wasn't going to be able to drink anyway. So, and it wasn't really an alcohol centric place. So it was, um, it was a safe place for me to be. Um, and, and hence the rebuilding began and like, I mean, the whole other story of how divorce went down. Um, and I stayed in the restaurant and stayed sober, did the 12 step recovery. Um, and there's just so much more, but, um, 
And I totally took so much time. I'm so sorry. Um, (laughs) like I, I am literally magnetized right now to your story. I am literally like, just keep going, say whatever you need to say. Cause I I'm like, I'm in it. Thank God for editors, right? They can, they can pull out the nuggets. (laughs) Um, I mean, so I will say, um, let's see. Yeah. I mean, AA honestly saved my life, um, in those, in newly sobriety, um, the deferred process. So I had a blow and go for a year. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) and I had a fifth and seventh grader and you know what, here's the thing. Yeah. Um, you would think I would be so ashamed and terrified of telling them about the logo. And trust me, it was no party, but to be honest, their sweet little faces were so relieved that for them, it meant something was going to change. Like that mom would have accountability and that like, so as terrible as it was to have to say, I was like, I go, mom made a horrible decision. And, you know, cause I'm like, I, I, so for me, blowing was a good thing and having that blow, like having to get the blow and go, um, in the deferred and all of it, it all worked out as it should. Right. And so even though it was the most horrific thing in my mind at the time, um, so, uh, so yeah, so I just remember that being a huge, like hard, hard thing, but also like they, like they would get in the car with me again, Mm -hmm. um, because it was a measure of protection that they understood. And, um, so, yeah, so I, you know, I, 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 by the kindness of God got this really cool, a friend helped me out for a little bit. Um, I had this gorgeous view place in her place that was like a mother-in-law and that was short term. And then I ended up, um, kind of nannying, doing restaurant, renting out the bottom of a house in Edmonds of another mom and helping out with her kids. That was a season. And so my kids kind of did the back and forth, And, um, and then it just got to the point where I had nothing to prove anymore. Like in the first year, after the first year of getting sober in my mind. So I was like, you guys don't have to do 50, 50. You can stay in the house. Um, uh, the house that, um, I left behind, uh, was the house I found when I was five months pregnant with Maggie and, um, their dad has that and they stayed there. And, um, and that was at that time important to me, like, you know, that they just have a place in all the change of everything. And so they, you know, it's the only house they've known. It's the only place they've been. And so, um, that was important. Uh, and so then, um, and then I guess about a year plus into sobriety, um, that the gal I was living with and nannying for and such sold the house. And then I was looking for a spot and I found a place in Richmond beach, like two minutes away from where my kids were. And, um, I rented a room in some friend's house and that was a great situation. Um, uh, well, it was tricky because I was so close to the house and, um, and so it was a blessing and it was hard because, um, I really feel like the grief of losing that marriage and that family happened, like really started how, I mean, there was bits and pieces of it, but I was still doing this kind of like jumping back into my old family life. Mm -hmm. Um, I was still doing restaurant. Um, I worked for some awesome restaurants in Edmonds and, um, and I was, I was grateful to be able to come back into the home at times and make meals and hang out with them because I was renting a room. I wasn't in a spot where, you know, I'd have them come and spend the night or, I mean, they actually did a few times. It was pretty fun, but I didn't really have capabilities of, cause it was a room rental and I was just rebuilding my life. And, um, and so, so, um, my, my main aim was staying sober, um, trying to figure out my new journey and healing my relationship with my children. And, um, and that is happening. It's still in progress. It's not perfect. And there's not a type you know, there's not a bow on top of it right now. Um, but I've had gifts in the middle of it. Um, it's been brutal, like, uh, you know, as Glennon says, beautiful and brutal. Um, you know, I think what helped really helped me in the first couple of years, besides AA recovery groups is I found Brene Brown. I had never heard of her before. And then about two years in, um, God knew I really needed to deal with this shame because I really carried for me with a long time, even though I'd like worked through the steps and everything, I didn't understand like, how this self-flagellation and carrying this, like, can I carry this cross long enough of all the things I was so ashamed of? Like, will I finally be forgiven? You know, like, when will it be enough? And I didn't understand that that was 
another form of like selfishness and kind of arrogance. Like, I was like, what do you mean? I feel terrible about myself, you know? And it was like, but as they say, if we stay in like self-pity and morbid reflection, we're useless, right? Like we are of no help and there's no healing that can happen. So that wasn't what God wanted. Like we're not servile and scraping. And we're also not like, you know, and we tend to go from like, I am so amazing to like, I am the worst. And it's like, can't we just be right size and in the middle? And I, that was really hard for me. I, I just wanted to beat myself up and be under this cross because like, you know, didn't I know better? Wasn't I a youth group girl? Wasn't I like, you know, and so finding Brene Brown was really just in all that, like <clears throat> how shame is, you know, really got me passionate about the mom guilt, shame and all the like, um, you know, uh, it really helped in my healing process. I went through, um, you know, all of her stuff. Um, there's the daring way and all of that. And that was a key part of it too. Um, okay. So pandemic hits and everything shut down. And the reason why this is important is because I had been, um, one thing I will say is when I made that choice to get honest and do whatever it takes, I really feel like power greater than me at every point, even if it wasn't perfect. And even if it wasn't what I wanted necessarily, um, just when I like needed the next thing came in the nick of time. And I will say that about Ben's friends. It, we just celebrated the Seattle chapter on Monday night, actually. Oh. Um, yes. And I didn't give you my details of that, but I post a lot of stuff on my Instagram hill spill of, um, about Ben's friends, about sober mom squad, about things, but, um, and about my kids and my dogs and food. But, um, so on Monday night, um, so three years ago, and this goes back to the point of like, if we make that brave choice, and I love this quote from Anthony Hopkins, He and I'm going to butcher it, but the idea of it is, is he at 45 years sober, and you can find it on Twitter. He made this statement like, you know, when you make that brave choice to get sober, all the mighty forces will come to your aid, you know? And it was like, or some idea like that. And I fully wholeheartedly, and I love that you, um, that your thing came from a wholehearted thing, because I feel like in this journey of sobriety, it's like, it, you come to this wholeheartedness, like our whole selves, our good, our bad, our ugly, you know, all of it. And it's, there's so many parts to it. And so I do believe that. And I want to, and I guess that's kind of wrapping into the message, getting to the message section of like, it is freaking terrifying to get sober and to, and, and like we've heard, you don't have, you just have to change one thing, everything. Right. And it's like, so, so the reason why I'm so grateful that Ben's friends coming in when it came is because I was um, we're continuing to work restaurant and I'd switched from my safe cocoon restaurant to a restaurant that was more like cocktails, drinking, um, good food, good wine, all the things. And they were great. I outed myself that I was sober after I got hired because I just feel like that's important for me, um, just to have that accountability. Cause like, if I'm not, um, well, spiritually, how easy will it just all of a sudden my brain tell me like, yeah, why don't you just have an after shift drink with your friends again? You know that, you know, um, and, and so it was important that that was part of my honesty. Um, and so I was working that and it was great. Um, and then actually, um, because I work a 12 step program, it was a sponsee who's also my friend. I always feel funny, like a sponsee, like I'm not her, like, you know, God or whatever. It's like, it's just my friend, you know, yeah. she's shot this, like, she's like, Hey, this looks like it would be right up your alley. And they had put on the news three years ago. Oh, this chapter of Ben's friends was opening up and it meets at eight row restaurant near green Lake, Kate and David, David, um, he's open about his sobriety. Uh, and Kate also, Kate is, um, I think she's three years or so ahead of me in sobriety, but we both have January birthdays and, um, she was the GM at the time. He's the chef, um, eight rows, a fantastic restaurant. They'd opened right before the pandemic. And after they opened, they, um, they believed wholeheartedly in the Ben's friends mission and they wanted to have one in a Seattle and, um, so the, uh, the founder, Steve Palmer came out and Mickey Bass co-founder, um, Steve has a book called say grace. And it's the same idea how the restaurant, mm -hmm. you know, how he, um, you know, rock bottom in the restaurant industry and also his saving grace of, or say grace is the name of the rest of the book. And it's how it also saved his life. And so, um, it came from a mission of just, as you read, um, you said it perfectly, just the, you know, having a heart, like addiction runs rampant in the restaurant hospitality industry. And so mm. I was trucking along probably three years of my sobriety and I did need something more. Um, I needed more support. It was great, but also, um, 
as I said, my friend suggested, this seems like right up your alley. And there was just this knowing, like, I need mm-hmm. to give it a try. Part of me was suspect because I was like, what? They advertise it on the news. Like, that's super cheesy. And I was like, <laughs> what am I getting into? And then it was like, I walked in the door and it was like another, just like alcohol had been like, initially it was like, oh, my people, like you just get the pressures of being in the hospitality industry and living for the drink. Like the reward is the drink, but they're changing the narrative and they're saying, maybe we don't, that doesn't have to be the reward. And how can we support you if you're trying to be sober in this industry? And so, so from my first meeting, um, met amazing people, you know, that just get it, just get like, what it is like, you know, to be sober in the hospitality industry. So yeah. So Monday night, um, we celebrated three years. So that came at a really like crucial time, but when the pandemic hit, um, it went online nationally and now they have a national zoom meeting every day at 10 AM. Um, and it's awesome. So now I've made all these friends. Actually, I didn't even realize I just put the shirt on this morning, but lo and behold, there's a restaurant of another fellow Ben's friends member in, um, uh, Northern California. So, I mean, it's like, I mean, I could spend hours saying how amazing Ben's friends has been in my um, sober life and just all the friends I've met um, in Austin, a whole group of friends at the Commodore, uh, Philip Spears, another sh- incredible chef. Um, anyway, Portland, amazing. So, um, so yeah. So if, I, you know, if anyone is still like super industry junkie and in hospitality, Ben's friends is like awesome They're you know, they can, they have chapters all over. They have, um, all over the States. Um, and they just, it's awesome. But for me, um, that's been a huge part over the last three years that really, so that's one of those cool things out of the pandemic, like, um, and then another thing was the sober mom squad. Um, she will Lauren McCallum. Okay. So going back to the quit like junkie, when I first got sober, besides the 12 step saving my life, I needed to hear other people's stories of like how they did it. Like, and Um, and so, I mean, I just have shelves and shelves of like all the things, drinking a love story, you know, blackout, you know, um, all, I mean, there's just so many good quit look, quit look, quit lit, sorry, books out there. Um, and yours recently, right? Like, I mean, it's awesome. Um, and, and so anyway, I read Emily Paulson's highlight reel, um, but I first read Laura McCowan's, um, and then she started the whole recovery group things when the pandemic hit, um, the luckiest club. And I had started going to those meetings. And then from that, just then I met Emily cause she was a host on that. And then Emily branched out and did the sober mom squad. And I can like, I, yeah, as you can gather the whole mommy wine culture was a huge part of my life, you know, until I even got kicked out of that because nobody could stand a drink around me anymore. Um, and And so um, I've been hosting, I host on Fridays at noon, um, a meeting Um, that is, you know, that is a subscription that people pay for and everyone has different feelings about that. But I'm just like all the alls. I'm all the paths to recovery. If whatever tools you need to get sober, um, do it. And so for me, 12 steps, my foundation, but I'm happy to give it back in the sober mom squad and the Ben's friends with the hospitality industry. Um, So yeah. Um, I think, I mean, is there, yeah. Is there any other okay. questions? No, yes. dude, you, okay. You have blown me away. There were so many times when I was sitting here listening to you, I was just so moved and related so much, identified so much. And I just thought, you know, the amount of people that you are going to help you know, just by sharing your story, because it's so multifaceted, you have so many parts to it. Um, I definitely want to have you back on so we can like unpack some of those other things too. But, you know, just the whole idea of seizing all of these opportunities as of late that have come into your life. I mean, what a blessing. I love that because it's just turning you know, that painful place, you know, or, or part of your story that just turning it into something beautiful and something, you know, that you probably never thought in the midst of your drinking that would happen. And I know for me, that's huge is turning, you know, my past becomes my greatest asset, right. And all of that. Um, I just, I'm so thrilled because 
here's what I wanted to say. Also, like there were so many things I wrote down. I'm like a weird, like nerdy, like note taker when people are telling <laughs> their story. It. But, you know, I mean, just the whole idea of like, I mean, we both were res 12 grads. I was too. <laughs> I've been to several, well, not several, one California treatment center twice. And then I did outpatient at res 12 and Lakeside. Woo. And then, um, <laughs> My little yeah. asylum. Right? <laughs> totally. And then, um, you know, just different parts, your family finances going towards alcohol. And I used to pad mine. So this was back in the day when, you know, you had to go to a liquor store to get liquor. So I'd buy so much wine and beer at Fred Meyer, but it was the grocery bill, quote unquote, and mm -hmm. um, all of that stuff. And then, um, you know, the the drinking so much perpetuating the shame, right? I mean, like just that cycle, right? And just hating what you see in the mirror because you just, you it's like you can't accept, but you kind of have to accept like this person who you don't know who you've become. And it's just like, it's mind blowing, right? And finding the Brene Brown later on when you got sober and and I loved that you looped it all back to Rachel Held Evans because, you know, when you were talking about having others help you with your living situation, when you were freshly divorced and you're newly sober at that point, and, and you know, really what that was, right, was giving others an opportunity to be of service. And I just think that's so beautiful because I know you know, it's just so hard, especially as moms to ask for help. It is so hard. And sometimes we have to, and, you know, just, just the grace and, and desperation for recovery, um, of you to do that. It was just very moving and, and I loved it. And, um, yeah, I just, the whole thing too, I have to say sidebar, just rewinding to, um, spending that night in jail, that is where I <laughs> had my kind of whatever it takes moment. So mm -hmm. totally related. And also the transactional Santa Claus God thing. I mean, that's how I looked at God, you know, but wait a minute, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, you know, attending all these Bible studies. Now you got to pony up and do for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, yeah. So, so many beautiful things in your story, um, but also, you know, while you were talking about Ben's friends, um, and I will, I'll try and, I'll try and wrap this up and we'll just continue it another time. But I wanted to say <laughs> about Ben's friends and about the restaurant industry is that I can't imagine what that was like, like my world, when I first got sober, I had my parents come and move in. Like I had to keep things so small and tight because, I mean, we had to move. We eventually moved because I mm. had done all my mommy wine club drinking in the neighborhood. And I, I couldn't be around those neighbors because I just, mm -hmm. I couldn't like get a new experience yet without physically separating from it. And so we, you know, moved just a town over, but still like it had to be that serious. And so I loved everything that you shared about the restaurant industry too, because that's another thing that I had to give up going out to dinner. We used to do that all the time. It was totally a part of my social life. And, and I remember in early sobriety, like we would even be at a PF Chang's. Okay. And I would see like a server walk by with a tray full of cocktails and I would just instantly salivate. I just could mm -hmm. not, like, I could not picture that this was now my life. Cause I still had the obsession for alcohol. Mm -hmm. And I really had a lot of social attachments to going out and all of that. And, and it was just so hard. I just had to push pause on it and just say, you know what? I don't, I don't think I can go out, but if it is your job, like your <laughs> source of income, I just mm -hmm. cannot imagine how difficult that would be. And so, um, you know, mad props to you because that's doing it double time. Like that's doing it super, you know, to be able to be in that position where it's like, well, this is my job, but yet I've got to somehow like build this bridge and make it work and choose a safe place to work 
you know, but you still probably were serving cocktails and um, yeah, I, I'm, I will say, I guess as I I'm remembering and cause now it's like six and a half years. And um, I will say that it was definitely having done so much damage in all my worlds where no one was comfortable drinking around me really helped. Like I, so I knew no one was going to be happy if they saw a drink. So that really like helped. And then at work, knowing I was on thin ice that helped. <laughs> but um, I will say that I had to plug in and change like, cause I was used to leaving work. I'd go to work and then after work, I would leave and go to a bar. So I just changed it, went to a recovery meeting and I had to do the work. So you brought up a great point. What I want to say is like, and you know, this truth that like, I'm free to go anywhere as long as, you know, I have a daily reprieve based on like my spiritual fitness. Right. And so like, if I'm not spiritually well, so it did take time. I don't mean to make it sound. And I know you weren't saying this, but like, I do want to emphasize it took time. I had to stay in that cocoon baby restaurant that I was in that was surrounded by friends that knew I was in hot water. And like, if they saw me drinking, like, I, like I had to have that accountability. I had to make massive different changes. And I did stay away from certain, like probably family, like my family drink centric and I love them. God love them. And they love me and they're proud of me. And for a bit, my first thing I did, that was a big test was at six months sober. My sister got married and it was my dream. Like in the past, it would have been a dream social event. Cause it was at a destination spot. It was like, you know, cocktail hour. It was gorgeous, good food, all the things. And that was my first thing. And the thing that got me through that was like, and it's the whole thing, you know, of that we know to be true of what I had to focus on the whole weekend was asking for help from my higher power, but also how can I be of help? How can I be of service? And it was like, what I kept thinking about how many times did was I the shit show that fucked everything up in my like either with like friends, parties, family parties, like made such an ass or like ruined it or took the focus off. So what really helped me get through that first big event at six months sober was like, this is my time to be of service to her. And if I pick up a drink, it's not going to be like a gift to her at all. And I was coming back from my self-centered, self-absorbed, you know, alcohol induced world. So like, that was a really hard thing. It was hard. Don't get me wrong. Like I remember having the thought in the morning when they were all getting ready and there was mimosas. I'm like, and I was by myself, like, you know, I was like, no one's going to know if I dip right now at six months. So I don't mean to paint it that there weren't times of testing or that it wasn't hard, but we know that like that spiritual fitness is essential to like, you know, and it's every day and I can't live on yesterday. And I only have one day at a time as cliche and trite as it is. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, and the spiritual fitness I need today is different, you know, than, when I first got sober, but yeah. So anyway, yeah. you just made me think of that. Like, you know, yeah, no, but you're right. And I think that that also speaks to, um, you know, just the general health of being open to all these different paths of sobriety or additional things that, you know, God brings or your higher power brings into your life. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we can't see those when we're drinking cause we're just blocked right from the sunlight of the spirit, or at least I was. And, yes. um, Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I, I'm like, I'm so moved by this story, Hillary. And I want to thank you for coming on and for just sharing your authentic truth, your whole, like all the things encompassing it because it all matters. It all belongs, right? Like I'm really into the whole contemplative thing. And it's like, there's so many times. Mm. Sort of Richard Rohr, it's another oh, connecting I piece. It. I fucking love him. I love him. <laughs> Breathing Underwater was another essential book I got along so my way. Good. There's so many breadcrumbs that come along the way, right? Yes. Oh, and I just have to slip this in to round my little bow part up because it just came like this. I feel like this has to be said where it talks about... Um, how we have to walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. And if we persist, remarkable things will happen. When we look back, we realize that the things which came to us, when we put ourselves in God, higher power, whoever for you, God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. Follow the dictates of a higher power and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world and unblocked by the spirit, all the things, no matter what your present circumstance. And I, when I first came in, I never could believe, I never thought that the promises will come true. I never believed that, I could have peace and serenity, even if my circumstances weren't what I wanted them to be. And anyway, I just like, I just yeah. feel like it's like that surrender, that let go, put it in God's hands and um, it'll be for the next time. I mean, I guess that's the carrot for the next time because yeah. like all the things that 
it was so much, and it's not like what you think better. It's not the cash and prizes better. It's just a different better that's hard to explain and put into words. But even like in the, within the last week is something as simple as I signed up for one sub job, which is a whole other story. I'm subbing in the school district right now, as well as serving tables at night. And um, the job I signed up for Monday, I got to the school, they put me in as a PE teacher for the whole week, which ended up being the most hilarious and fun job. And my former spouse has been a PE teacher for the last 24 years. So does God have a fucking sense of humor? Yes. Can I, I love it. Pathetic? Yes. So anyway. Okay, oh I'm my done. gosh. No, I'm dead. And uh, P.S. <laughs> like that is also impressive to me because I also wrote down that you have a sociology degree and I didn't. Mm -hmm. That's impressive to me because I didn't take sociology because you had to take math, statistics, <laughs> statistically. And I was oh, like, I oh, know. Yeah. Like, so it just cracks me up that. Yeah, that, you know, you just- That was one of the toughest classes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, pass on that one, hard pass. Wait, um, what was your degree? What did you end up with? In communication. Yeah. Okay. Communication. Awesome. Yeah, graveyard with a bunch of other people too who didn't know what they wanted to be when they grew up, quote unquote. So, um, but it worked out, you know, it worked out. And, you know, that's what I would say too for you. I just love hearing all these new connections that your higher power is bringing into your life. So to unpack for a later time, but I just have to tell you, like, you know, this has just been so lovely to hear. You have a beautiful aura. Your spirit is so strong. And I so appreciate everything that you've shared today. And so, so thank you, Hillary. And if people want to find you, they can find you on Sober Mom Squad. Yeah, um, well, that's a subscription. So actually just um, my Instagram is Hillspill, H-I-L-S-P-I-L, Hillspill at, um, well, not at, what am I adding it for? It's on Instagram. I'm like, I'm ready to say okay. at yahoo.com. That's my email. But <laughs> Okay, oh my gosh. perfect. Because anyway. let me hold on while I give you my MySpace profile. Because yeah, <laughs> I always, I, I totally. miss MySpace. <laughs> I do, I miss it. I miss the music and the... anyways. Um, Hilarious. This was a gift. Thank you so much, Hillary. Thank and you. To everybody listening uh, for your bailout bag, which is, of course, from jail. They give you the, your bag of clothes back. Be kind, rewind, and thank you for the honor of your time. Take what you like and find valuable and leave the rest behind. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you.